Hi everyone, we're talking about skin tags in this lesson. So we're going to talk about what they are, what causes them, and some risk factors for getting them. We'll also talk about some associated signs and symptoms, how they're diagnosed, and how they're treated. So skin tags are also known as acrocordins. They are benign skin neoplasms, and we're going to get into more specific detail about some of the pathogenesis behind why they occur in the next slide. Now, skin tags are a relatively common skin finding. They affect approximately 50 to 60% of the general population. Now, the prevalence of skin tags increases with increasing age. So as a patient gets older, they're more likely to have skin tags, particularly after the age of 40. And as a patient does get older, after the age of 60, for instance, upwards of two thirds of patients will have these skin findings. Now, although skin tags often don't have an associated condition or an associated cause, they can be associated with obesity, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome. So having obesity, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome may increase the likelihood of having them, may increase the number of these skin tags, or may increase the size of these skin tags. And in some patients, these skin tags are going to occur due to genetic reasons. So there's likely a genetic component in some cases because it has been found that if a patient has a family history of skin tags, so if their parent has skin tags, they are more likely themselves to also have skin tags as well. And there is a rare autosomal dominant condition known as Bert hogg dube syndrome, which does increase the likelihood of having skin findings, including skin tags and some other benign neoplasms as well. So this is something else that can involve a larger number of skin tags in some individuals. Now let's talk about the potential causes and some of the proposed pathophysiological mechanisms behind why skin tags occur. So the onset and development of skin tags is believed to involve either frequent irritation of the skin, so frequent irritation of skin, especially in certain skin folds or rubbing of the skin against clothing, those types of irritating mechanisms have been proposed in the development of skin tags. And there may be some hormone imbalances or changes in hormone levels that lead to either onset of these skin tags or development or growth of these skin tags. Some of the hormones that have been proposed include progesterone, estrogen, growth hormone, and epidermal growth factor. So higher levels of these particular hormones may lead to or increase the growth of skin tags. And skin tags themselves are a mass of loose fibrous tissue. They may be a part of normal aging of the skin, but there does appear to be some relationship to these mechanisms and some of these hormones we just talked about here. Now let's talk about the clinical features of skin tags. So here is one skin tag. So if we were to actually look at it, it is a raised skin lesion that is rounded in appearance. It is pedunculated, pedunculated meaning that there is a small stalk that connects this large mass of fibrous tissue to the underlying skin. It is soft. If it were to actually be palpated, it is a soft lesion. It's often small in size, ranging from 0.5 to 5 millimeters. These skin tags can change in size as a patient does get older, so their skin tags can increase in size as the patient themselves get older. And in some cases, the skin tag can be either smaller than 0.5 millimeters or larger than 5 millimeters, but this is going to be the average size of the skin tag. And oftentimes, the skin tag is going to be the same color as the underlying skin tone, or it may be hyperpigmented and it is often going to be slightly hyperpigmented more often than not. Here is another skin tag and here's another example of a skin tag. So again they are raised, pedunculated, meaning that they have a thinner underlying stalk that connects them to the underlying skin. They are soft, they are often small in size, most often ranging from 0.5 to 5 millimeters in size and they are most often hyperpigmented although they might not be. Skin tags are going to occur more in particular areas of the body than in other parts of the body. The parts that are going to be most affected by skin tags are going to be the neck, the axilla or the armpits, and the groin area or the inguinal folds. So because they occur in the axilla and the groin or the inguinal folds, these intertriginous areas, meaning that there are two layers of skin that rub against each other more frequently, this is why it's believed that rubbing or irritation of the skin is a potential trigger for the onset of skin tags. So again, neck, axilla, and groin or inguinal folds of the groin are going to be most commonly affected with skin tags. But although these are the most common sites where skin tags are going to occur, any part of the skin may be affected. So 
There can be skin tags in other areas of the body as well, but these are by far going to be the most common sites. Now, there may be some associated symptoms from these skin tags in some individuals, although they are going to most often be relatively asymptomatic, meaning that they are not going to cause any symptoms for the patient. But some potential symptoms that a patient may experience from these skin tags includes itching. So itching may occur, especially if the skin tag is in a particular area of the body that is becoming irritated. Irritation of the skin tag itself may occur as well, leading to pain or inflammation of the skin tag. So the skin tag itself can become painful or reddened or inflamed. So it can look like this. And then it can just be a nuisance to some patients if it's rubbing against clothing or jewelry, for instance. How do clinicians diagnose and treat skin tags? The diagnosis is going to be a clinical diagnosis by looking at the skin lesion itself that is going to be enough to make the diagnosis. Because they are so common, they're often going to be overlooked. They're going to be a benign finding. If there is some question as to whether or not the skin tag is some other condition, the skin tag itself can be removed and sent to pathology to see if it is another condition. So that is something else that can be thought about as well. There are other skin lesions and skin findings that can look like skin tags, although those particular conditions and those skin findings themselves are oftentimes benign as well. So we won't get into those here, but for the most part, these are going to be a clinical diagnosis, especially if they're found in those areas we talked about before, and they've been with the patient for many years, that is going to be enough to make a clinical diagnosis. How do clinicians treat these skin tags? Remember, they are benign skin growths. Oftentimes, they can just be left alone. They don't need to be treated. But if there is some problem or irritation or for a cosmetic reason, they can be removed. If they are smaller, if they're closer to the 0.5 or 2 millimeter size, they can be treated with a snip excision or cryotherapy. So using liquid nitrogen on these skin lesions can help to remove them or for very, very small lesions, electrodesiccation can be used. For larger growths, around five millimeters or larger in size, a snip excision can also be used and a shave excision can be used as well. So I hope you found this lesson helpful. That was a lesson on skin tags. If you want more information on other dermatological conditions, please check out my dermatology playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.